A cemetery walk was held at the Druin West Cemetery on the 5th of March 2018. First to speak was Jill Bailey, who outlined the history of the cemetery and the Jindavik area. On the 17th of December 1877, the Government gazetted 20 acres in the county of Boon Boon in the parish of Druin West for a cemetery. Five men were appointed as the trustees, Thomas Walton, James McGinn, Benjamin Doherty Smith, James Sutherland and Andrew Blythe. At the same time as this cemetery was being established, there was gold being discovered at Crossover and Rokeby and the bigger run up at Walhalla. So there was a lot of movement in the area at the time. There were few or no bridges across the numerous creeks. A coaching station had been established down at Brandy Creek. And there was also a toll gate down there and a post office and a smattering of hotels of which the Robin Hood, which was a brewery at the time and owned by the Dickens family, is the one that's still remaining. And the purpose of the toll gate was to stop the farmers moving their cattle through so we could keep this open here for the mail's coach run. While this area was being established, the railway was being built to Druin and the first train steamed into Druin Junction in 1878. Jill introduced Jeff Mitchell, who described the development of the family farm in Jindavik. Peter Mitchell carried on with the farm work, as everybody had to in those days. He died when he was 50. He had a tooth extracted and got blood poisoning. So he was only 50. So that meant my grandfather had lost both his parents by the time he was 21 and had quite a large farm to look after. It was a large farm that had to be developed. It was still tall trees and all that sort of stuff. They used to plough about an acre of land a day in those days and they would have had more trees to keep clearing. So it was plenty of hard work. The war came along and he was growing a lot of flax during the war effort. And he was working with the Department of Ag, developing new strains of flax. So much so that one strain of flax was named after the property out here called Hazeldean, which was named after the hazel brush that was found on the property. He grew uh, flax, potatoes, milked a few cows... The cow milking didn't really take off until about 1938 when the electricity was put on the farm. Jack Notman told the story of his family's participation in the business and social life of Jindavik over four generations. They purchased our farm, 320 acres, on the West Jindavik Road in 1888 and they named it Dalton Park, a name which it still carries in 2018. Dalton, by the way, was a little district near Dumfries where they came from. They did some grazing, but strangely, my grandfather wasn't able to learn to milk. So his wife and all the children, they got out and milked the cows. But my father said that grandfather couldn't learn to milk. And he he allegedly tried very hard, but he's the only person I've ever heard of who couldn't learn to milk. I played my first game of tennis at Jimmick in 1937. I was 14 and played my last game of competitive tennis at Jimmick 59 years after that. Bill Pechak told of the arrival in Australia of his great grandfather and the development of the farm in Jindavik, and outlined the story of Bill Palmer as well. In 1891, there was a newspaper journalist who did a little bit of a write up on the farm out there and he described it as one of the most productive and profitable farms in the district. The property had been fenced with a permanent creek each end of the property, 22 feet of rich chocolate soil, and the apple trees were 20 to 30 feet in height. He also started carrying out dairy. The home on the property was described as being built out of just one tree. The house was a split palings on the wall, single roof, two passageways with bedrooms on either side and a massive brick oven, because so, he had such a large family. One of his sons, Joanne Joanne Henry, I should say, that's the grandfather of Lorna, Jack and Keith Pretty. He's also buried in the cemetery. My grandfather and Edward William, uh, he's just on the left as you come in the cemetery, and a daughter, Dorothea. So there's three other family members buried in this Druin West Cemetery. This fellow here, Johan, he served as a councillor on the Bullen Bullen Shire for nine years. 
He was the Shire's first citizen of the year back in 1895-96. And upon his death in 1905, his son Henry took over and he was on the Shire for 18 years. And also my grandfather Edward William, he was another councillor for 15 years. So in those three people in that family, they served over 50 years on the Shire of Bourne Bourne. Judy Farmer spoke of the life and professional activities of Dr Robert Mary Smith with an insight into medical practice at that period. Dr Smith took over the practice of Dr David Trumpy Sr who had started practice in Bullen Bullen before moving to Druin. Dr Smith arrived in Druin in 1890 and began practice moving into Dr Trumpy's house in Main Street, Druin. In the 1890-91 rates book he shows as M.D., owning property with a frontage of 99 feet in the main street. The house was a large, six-roomed weatherboard villa with two chimneys, a front veranda and a front door on one side and a hexagonal-shaped bay window on the other side. Unfortunately, it's been demolished and today is number 7 Princess Way Druin, a set of very ordinary-looking units. Dr Smith met Jessie Isabella Grant when doing a medical visit to one of the younger children in the Grant family. She was 19 years old and he was about 25 years old when they were married in 1891. The report in the local paper says they were married by Mr Hall Angus at 10am on Monday the 19th of October 1891 at the bride's residence. The happy pair left by the 11.40am train amid showers of good luck. On November the 9th, 1870, John McNeely came to Druin Junction and pegged out 320 acres of virgin bushland that he had selected. He applied for a settlement of Crown land on November the 14th, 1870, which was granted to him on January the 31st, 1871. John McNeely was the first person to actually take out land rights in Druin. He arrived in Druin with his wife Eliza and four children in November 1871. They and their young family, who ranged in age from 10 years to 5 months, had travelled overland by horse and wagon. It may well have been a bullock dray, but we're uncertain of that. But what is interesting is that we have the compass that brought them across country, and this was a prized possession of my mother's. And it's just a little wee compass, quite a simple piece of apparatus, I guess. It's just a treasure. He ploughed and cultivated 34 acres to plant <clears throat> crops of maize, potatoes and clover, as well as planting fruit and nut trees. Many of the ferns from his property ended up being sent to the Bendigo Public Gardens to be planted there. Another of his undertakings was to start a daily milk ground by delivering milk to the township's residents. On February the 19th, 1874, he made his first payment to the government and was granted the freehold of his property in September 1880. John's son, Sam, found an injured lyrebird in the bush and brought it home to feed. It became a very tame family pet and lived on the property. It was named Jackie, and when Eliza called the family to meals, Jackie called them too. He was an excellent mimic and would imitate the McNeely Bullock drivers' commands of gee up, woo there, and back up, baldy. He and his mate used to walk into the Druin Township. They were well known. Perhaps his loss had led to his mimicry of poor old Jack. Jackie became famous, his story being told some years later in the Victorian school newspaper and also referred to in the Royal Auto Journal in October 1960. But I'm just reading a, an article here from the Brisbane Telegraph, which was uh, published the 25th of April 1931, about the bird. A notable case was that of Jack of Druin, Victoria, a lyre bird that was caught as a youngster in 1885 and lived about the farm of Mr Sam McNeely for 20 years. It is on record that Jack's plumage gradually improved and after six years he developed a magnificent tail. Sometimes he wandered from the farm, but always he returned. While work was going on, he was frequently in the way, hence his chief saying, Look out, Jack! Among his favourite imitations were the noise of a horse and dray moving slowly with the play of the wheels in the axle boxes, chains rattling, etc., an occasional gee up, Bess, and the sounds of a violin, piano, cornet, cross-cut saw, etc., all the more frequent noises about the farm the bird learnt to perfection, 
such as a pig being killed, a dog howling, a child crying, flocks of parrots screaming, kookaburras laughing, and many cries of small birds. At the sight of strangers, the wonderful bird became quiet, but he would follow them like a dog. Once he was found three miles away, his usual answer to the men saying, Poor Jack, was not, Poor Jack, Fat Jack, which the men had taught him to say. John eventually bought a house in the town in Albert Street, near Grant Street, and he and Eliza moved there in about 1900, leaving his sons Sam and Will to run the farm on his selection. John Jr., or Jack, was running the property at sale, Sam having sold him his share as well. In April 1901, John McNeely Sr. died at the age of 74, just a few weeks short of his 75th birthday. Until 1860, George and family lived at 38 Cardigan Street, North Melbourne. George, with brother James, established a blacksmithing business and manufactured agricultural implements at 44 Elizabeth Street, North Melbourne, between Victoria Street and Queensbury Street. I have copies of advertisements with the business listed as 14 Elizabeth Street and also at 44 Elizabeth Street. They were the first manufacturers in the colony to make a completely iron-framed plough. And Mr Russell sent a plough out to them from Scotland and I presume this was the basis for their design. This design was known locally as the Scotch plough. It was very successful in ploughing matches. Some of the trophies are in the possession of family members. I have a cruet set and a teapot. A lot of the others were lost when the last of his unmarried daughters died and the wife of the executor sent them to a scrap metal dealer. I have three of his ploughs. The first two I bought were not complete, but the last one purchased has all its parts and looks to have done little work. There is a larger road plough in the Lake Goldsmith Steam Preservation Society grounds near Beaufort. He also took out a patent for an improved pitman drive for mowers. Now this is a transcript from the South Gippsland Express, dated 17th of January 1884. Glen Fern, the property of Mr G. O. Grant, President of the Bulnbun Shire Council, is situated rather less than two miles from Druin on Lardner's Track and comprises an area of 160 acres of freehold land. I may as well premise by stating that Mr Grant is the original manufacturer of Grant's celebrated and far-famed prize ploughs, and some eight years ago left Melbourne and selected in this district. His selection of 320 acres being some four miles farther on to the west near Lardner's. Mr Grant subsequently purchased the land the subject of this sketch, upon which he has resided with his family, and apparently had his share of this world's goods, which no one could envy him the enjoyment of, after the years of toil and hardship, which had to be undergone before this can be accomplished. Glenfern is situated upon a range of hills, extending up to the Moey watershed, and one of the tributaries of the King Parrot Creek runs through the land, going eastward into the Kewingrup Swamp. The place has been heavily timbered, more so even than Brandy Creek, and at one edge of the farm is to be seen a portion of the original scrub, which gives one some faint idea of the difficulties which beset the pioneers of this district, who deserve to be much better treated by the government in the matter of railway communication than they have hitherto been. At Balnageith, ducks were kept and the eggs were sent to Melbourne by train to provide income until the orchards started producing fruit. Dad said he and his sisters had to gather the eggs in the morning and clean and pack them for transport before school. A packing shed was built and machinery installed for grading fruit into sizes. Local men were employed to pick the fruit and girls to wrap the fruit in tissue paper and pack into cases, often their only source of income for the year. Tea and biscuits were supplied for morning and afternoon tea break. The fruit was exported to England. Dad said he only heard him swear once. There are up ladders in the orchard pruning at the end of a row of trees overlooking the golf course next door. They had a good view of the tee where golfers were hitting off. One golfer who had a habit of taking a long time to hit off was repeatedly stamping his feet side to side and waving the club in preparation to make the shot. Dad could see his father getting increasingly annoyed about the time he was taking to hit off 
and he burst out with, Look at the silly bugger, he's like a rooster stamping on a hen. The golf course was on the dairy farm adjoining the orchard. The dairy farm golf course was 103 acres running from near Walker Drive up to the McNeely Road, Hopeton Road corner. Keith later bought the dairy farm and it was possible to see where the ground had been levelled off for tees many years later. When we cleaned the creek, we would often pull out golf balls. So a little bit about Druin Station. So it was established in 1878. It was a single platform and they built a lovely building with four chimneys on it and it had waiting rooms and station master's office and parcels area. And that building was sort of about where the station is now but a little bit closer to the Bendigo Bank area and a little bit sort of closer towards the main street and there was just the one track going through. The station had a a lovely platform veranda and the veranda had posts along the platform. It was the full length of the station building. Another accident that happened at Druin, this one was 600 metres from the station at the Warrigal end and it happened on Tuesday the 5th of February 1985. It was quite a hot summer's day. The temperature was just on 100 degrees. Passenger train was coming from Warrigal, approached the curve 600 metres on the Warrigal side of Druin and the track buckled underneath the train. It was an L-class locomotive and it had three in carriages on the back. When the track buckled underneath the train, the locomotive ran off the track and went to the side of the embankment and when it got to the side of the embankment, the front half went over the bank and then twisted on top of the bank. With both bogies being in the air, it did a full 180 degrees turn, so the driver was facing back towards Warrigal. Then the head of the locomotive, with the pantographs on top, fell over the bank and went pantograph first, and slid down the side of the bank and come to rest beside a big pine tree. There was five passengers in the train, the three carriages concertinaed on top of the track. The station staff, I think it was Peter Earls was working at the time at Druin Station. He was inside and he was looking at the signal frame, watching on the diagram the train arriving into Druin. He had it hit on and then all of a sudden he said he heard the wires ring and twist and buckle from in the station. And then he looked out and couldn't see any sign of the train but saw a lot of dust. He was a bit concerned because there was another train coming from Melbourne and he put all the signals to stop in front of the other train coming through platform two. He went out and with the other driver walked out onto the track and they could see the carriages on top of the track but couldn't see the locomotive and as he arrived and there was the overhead wires were lying around on the ground several staunchons bent over and as he looked down on the south side of the embankment they could see the bogies of the locomotive facing up towards them. They climbed up on the side of the locomotive and looked in the front, but they couldn't see anyone inside the cabin, and they were a bit worried about what happened to the driver and the fireman. And with that, they heard a noise and looked at the Warrigal end, and the driver was making his way out of the door at the Warrigal end. And that's when they realised that the locomotive had did a full twist around on top of the embankment. The block of land, obviously still covered with trees, was donated by Mrs Richard Higgs and was on the south side of Grant Street, near Albert Road. It must have been a hive of industry for the next couple of months because the completed church was ready for dedication on Sunday the 18th of January 1880. The Dean of Melbourne, Dean McCartney, dedicated Christ Church on that day with the prayers read by the Reverend S. Sandiford and the lesson by Captain E. Lintot. When the Weatherboard Church was moved to its new site in 1891, the Board of Guardians showed unusual foresight by having it positioned across the rear of the allotment to allow room for the construction of a new church at some future date. That did happen, but it took 45 long years. 
The foundation stone was laid on the 1st of February 1936. That's a week later than was shown on the stone. The stone was carved ready for the day when King George V died and we got news in the morning. The laying of the stone was postponed a week so the date on the stone is different from the actual date it was laid. There is a metal box behind the stone. It contains papers of the day, a scroll sitting at the details of various executives and signatures of those concerned and some coins. As I've already said it was a depression so I don't think it would be worthwhile digging it up as the coins were all small. I don't think there's any paper money put in. The 1880 timber building situated where it was deposited in 1891 as described. A new role for the old church became the domain of the young people and was known under many names. The Kindergarten Hall, the Youth Church Hall, the Kanga Hall, and due to renovations carried out over the years by faithful parishioners, it kept on working. In 2003, Reverend Alan Huggins conducted a simple and moving ceremony declaring that it be known as Maxfield Hall, in recognition of Iris and Colin Maxfield for their many years of devoted work and support for the youth of Christchurch and the local community. The second group of stained glass windows by Andrea Tyndall of Druin. Andrea was commissioned to produce two stained glass windows for the new building of 2007 at Christchurch. Her notes are these. The East Sanctuary window illustrates the parable of the sower from Luke 8, 9 to 10. And the North Sanctuary window, a popular symbol of Druin, she uses the Physifolia flowers and the tree in the background of it, intertwined with a cross, and the river of life flows around the tree, symbolising our journey forward. The rich golden pinks of the flowers is symbolic of Christ, central to our community, and linking back to Christchurch Druin. The First World War took an enormous toll upon the world. Australia was among many countries that paid a high toll with deaths due to the conflict between 1914 and 1918 of about 60,000. That was part of the reason why one part of the commemoration was the planting and dedication of six commemorative golden elm trees along the verge in front of our church, along the path between the RSL and the Memorial Park, each tree representing about 10,000 men who died some townships paid a very high price, and Druin was no exception, with 66 men perishing in the Great War. So, on a local level, each of the six trees could represent 11 local men who perished. The Druin Cemetery Walk, recorded on the 5th of February 2018, is a part of Druin's Physifolia Festival. It was opened by Tim Wills, who recounted the history of the cemetery and its management. So this brings me to highlight the now famous cemetery photo of Mrs Josephine Smith, who was the grave digger in the 40s. I'm sure everyone knows this photo and the others in the collection. They certainly give us a wonderful understanding of life in Druin in wartime conditions. Over the years, different groups have been responsible for the upkeep of the cemetery. In earlier times, volunteers organised working bees to maintain the grounds, but unfortunately they could not keep up with the required work and the cemetery became overgrown and covered in blackberries. In 1965, the Bullumbull and Shire Council and the Druin Cemetery Trust entered into an agreement and the Shire's parks and garden staff, led by Superintendent Leo Boyan, soon made a huge difference to the appearance of the cemetery. And Leo certainly made a huge difference all around the town during his tenure as the boss. In 1990, the Trust commenced using its own staff and equipment. Beverly Jackson told the story of the Renton brothers. After his discharge, we become a policeman also, the tallest in the state, standing six foot eight in his boots, pipping the record which his brother Harold had held up to then. Arthur died in 1966, aged 74. Returning to Frank Renton, he arrived in France on the 1st of April 1916, attached to the 102nd Howitzer Battery. 
Frank was wounded three times, including being gassed in Belgium in 1917, recuperating in England. He served out the war, returning to Australia on the 31st of May 1919. Frank at first applied to join the police force too, but unfortunately, due to hearing loss, his application was unsuccessful. On the 22nd of December 1920, Frank married Mary Elizabeth Besenko and they had four children. Frank had played in wartime football competitions and after the war, Frank and Harold played football for the Druin Football Club, being the tallest and biggest men of the Central Gippsland League. Frank played with Druin for about three years as first ruckman, being named best on ground on numerous occasions. He became captain of the team and was also selected in combined teams of the league as first ruckman. Brian Milner told the story of J.D. Grubb. John's next phase of life was one of marriage to Vera, business and scouting. He owned and operated a building supply and hardware merchant business on the corner of the main street in Bank Place, right on the corner there, almost opposite the post office. He also operated a funeral parlour in the old Denny's second-hand business. Do you remember that building that's now got a cafe and financial uh, funeral service business there as well? I'm not sure if he operated them concurrently, but it certainly would make sense if he did, as there would have been a ready supply of the hardware to build coffins, particularly timber and the, the screws and the... A fairly smart operator, I would suggest. He was never going to go broke, was he? The marital home was situated on the corner of Young Street and Bank Place, opposite Bank Place Dental Clinic that's there now, that vacant block that keeps getting sold time and time again. In fact, my wife remembers with my mother delivering Meals on Wheels there to Mrs Grubb in the mid-80s, so she was still living there then. John was heavily involved in the scouting movement, particularly here in Druin, but he started with the first Druin Scouts in 1923 and on the 1st of March 27 was appointed as Scoutmaster. He was then on the 1st of August 1931 appointed as the Group Scoutmaster. He was the driving force behind the building of a dedicated Scout Hall. They had been meeting in a tin shed behind what is now the, the Druin Library. Shelley Duncan told the story of Dr Edward Hamp. In the 1944 photos that we've got as well, there's a photo of Dr. and Mrs. Hamp in their living room, and Helen is playing the piano, and the twins, Elizabeth and Margaret, um, were just playing a game on the floor. It does look like a rather staged photo, but it does show the time. <laughs> yeah. It said there that Elizabeth and Margaret both attended Druin State School, and that Helen, I love this bit, was at a boarding school in the large provincial town of Sale. <laughs> In October 1947, there was a garden party and they called the house Gillian, I'm not sure why, for the CWA Food for Britain Appeal. So apparently they had quite a few garden parties there at the house for different fundraising events. And that's certainly one because even in 1947, even into the 1950s, food was very, very scarce in Britain still. Susie Gallagher told the story of the Furman family. William Frederick, their oldest son, married Ida Gabbett. And they lived in Bennett Street, Druin, and they had 14 children, five boys and nine girls. It was Bill, Frieda, Frieda's buried over there, and Molly's buried over there, Laurie, Merle, Vic, Bob, Charles, baby Charles, died at one day old, he's in this grave. Ruby, Jack, oh Jack, Jack's here, Ned is down there, Audrey, June and Beth, and they all went to Druin State School. William was a builder and he built a lot of houses around the Druin district, as far out as Nearham South and Allenbank. All the four boys, Bill, Bob, Jack and Ned, were all involved in the scout group. Jack for over 75 years. He's got a medallion for that. And also they were all in the fire brigade and all four being part of a hose and reel running teams, competing in competitions all over the Victoria. In the last couple of decades, we have also been known to promote ourselves as chicks with attitude. This sits very comfortably on us. There is nothing wrong with attitude. It motivates and drives us. Our first association members possessed great attitude. Our founding Druin members had buckets full of attitude and drive. 
they lost no time and their initial priority was the need for a baby health centre. And then a couple of years later, the establishment of new public conveniences in Druin. Not bad for their first three years' work. I might add here that in 1956, the annual secretary's report commended the appeal just launched to endeavour to build a play centre or kindergarten on the site adjoining the baby health centre. The branch worked towards this end and here, now in 2018, the Oak Street Kindergarten is still a great asset to our community. There is a Jim Fitzpatrick photograph of a group of ladies outside the Mechanics Institute with a prominent sign, Talkies. This photograph is a wonderful snapshot in time, clearly illustrating the dress of the day, as well as hairstyles, hats, and various modes of carrying goods. Names put to faces include Mesdames, Wellwood, Hamley, Lilly, Ferguson, Gowdy, Smythe, Holmes, and Hunter. There is some conjecture as to whether these ladies were gathered for a Red Cross meeting or a CWA meeting. In his 1996 book entitled Because They Worked At It, John Wells has attributed it to CWA, and the names are certainly consistent with this assumption. Some of the branch's earliest photographs were taken in October 1940 at a garden party held in the grounds of Mrs Craft's home at 156 Princess Way on the corner of Albert Road. There is a lovely shot of Mrs Craft sitting on the edge of her fish pond with the caption, The Precedent Reflects. Another general view of this same event shows well-dressed ladies complete with hat and gloves chatting in the garden setting with canvas deck chairs and a striped umbrella. A delightful corner of this photo shows a very smart pram with a baby sitting upright decked out in a knitted bonnet. The wonderful ladies of the Druin branch did not rest on their laurels once they had established and paid off their own club room. As a project for Victoria's 150th anniversary in 1984-85, they erected and financed the building of a brick street stall. No mortgage this time, but lots of hard work to raise the required $6,000. The kiosk was designed, sited and built as part of the remodelling of Druin's main street. The project received the full support of the Shire Council. Directly following the official opening in April 1985, the street stall premises was given by the CWA to the community for everyone's use. Druin had its own land army office with Arthur Holmes coordinating the enlistments. He was an agricultural expert employed by the Commonwealth Government's War Agricultural Committee to administer central Gippsland's 7,000 square miles of rich dairying country. Many of the Druin-based Land Army girls were employed separating linseed oil-bearing seeds from flax stalks at the local mill. Canvas and webbing were made from the stalks. Amongst our branch memorabilia and photographs, we have a photograph taken in 1984 which shows life members Hazel Porter, Jessie Gowdy and Priscilla Craft, together with Pam Pretty and Lorraine Kinraid, who were to join the ranks of life members the following year. We had the train, we had this one. Wally Gerard, our captain, was a very strict person. We practised on the Sunday mornings and Tuesday nights. We had a meeting every once a month. I think it was a Monday night. It wasn't every week, it was every month. We used to get a pretty good turnout to the meetings. Captain Gerard, he uh, demanded that we went to these meetings, which was good because we were learning. Druid was just a new brigade. It was only about a year old, I think, of it when I joined it. The station was built in 1937, I think, and I joined in 38. We had to keep ourselves clean and dressed nice, or not nicely, but cleanly. And in those days, it wasn't easy to get nice clothes. Well, I was that only young. I used to deliver meat for winters on a Saturday morning on a horse. I got two shillings Saturday morning. For that, and with that I would go down to a little draper's shop attached to a grocery store. Uh, it was a, a little haberdashery shop. I used to give him the two bob. I had to go down and give it to him and it paid me three hours of stuff or whatever I wanted, so he was quite happy to do that. I bought a bike off W.D. Russell 
at Russell's Garage and I paid him two bob a week. I don't know how long for. But they built the drill and fire station up. We had showers and cups of tea, you could make a cup of tea and all that sort of thing. But I just lived opposite across the railway line. And I could get there pretty quick. We had a bell, big bell, out in the front of the fire station. And the first one there rang the bell. We had to take a phone call, of course, to find out where it was. Rang the bell and you had to wait until they all got there, or as many as you needed, got there and before you got on the truck. Well, there was a chap in the town who was in the brigade. His name was Jinnah Black. Well, he had a truck. We used to climb on the back of the truck and hang on. We didn't have a, a means of carrying hose, only we had what they call a reel. The hose was wound onto the reel. It was like a, a horse and cart thing to look at. Some of us used to sit on the back of Ginger's truck and hang onto the reel and pull it along the road. A drill that had four captains in the life of the brigade. Wally Gerard, Ernie Caddy, Peter Smithers, and Johnny Atkins. They're all long stayers. The only one that didn't last very long was Peter Smithers. Johnny Atkins, he's been in for years. The raw materials that would have come in from the warehouse, some of the older warehouses used to keep at Rock Thompson, for instance, who kept these old tinctures and things that were used to add to make syrups and flavourings. Our tablets usually come in bulk, especially the sulphur drugs, uh, which we counted out into whatever the doctor wanted, how many. We used a triangular counter to count tablets, which is very ingenious. The number of rows you had in the triangle indicated how many tablets were there. It doesn't matter what size. Very clever. The making of these bulk mixtures in, was done by pestle and mortar. The pestle is the thing that turns around and the mortar is the base. The process is called trituration and you start with a small amount and you keep on adding till you get the volume. It, it's a fair bit of handiwork to do that. You slowly add the ingredients, the more important ones first, and then grind them up into a powder. And then you add flavouring, which is usually a syrup of some sort, syrup simplex or syrup of orange or something like that, and then add water up to volume. I came to Druin in 1981 on recommendation to look at buying a small pharmacy owned by Jeff and Shirley Wadham. The business was opened in 1964. Shirley was already a chemist and Jeff qualified on a rehab scheme to train returned servicemen. Then Jeff, he was our chemist and our Jeff best served in the RAF during the war and survived as a rear gunner in probably a Lancaster in many sorties. The Wadham shop at 99 Princess Highway was very small initially but was extended to twice the size but to my mind was still small and cluttered. I saw room for improvement. The price was reasonable and I could work in the chemist as an assistant and purchase in six months if I desired. A good offer for my first business. Jeff Wadham was very good to me, showed me around, introduced me to the golf club, the bowling club, the Lions club and Rotary, which I joined later. Also taught me how to drink. Good for business, he said. I wondered if Jeff and Shirley's customers would accept me as they had been there a long time. Jeff was a good businessman, a chemist, and very popular. How could I replace him? After the six months, I did purchase the business. Now Wadham's Pharmacy, 99 Princess Way, and continued as before. As I gained confidence, I decided to, to do a major refit with the help of a chemist shop designer and fitter from Melbourne that I knew. It turned out to be the son of the original shop fitter that the Wadhams had engaged. A new shop front with self-opening doors, new ceiling, lighting, floor coverings and counters, shelving and dispensary. It was an amazing transformation. As the business was expanding, I needed bigger premises and I asked Mr Bill Burrows, the news agent, if he would build me a new shop of my design on vacant land behind his building, facing Hope Street and Commercial Place on the corner. To my surprise, he agreed with the conditions. So, Wadham's Pharmacy, one Hope Street was built and fitted out to my specifications and opened by the Shire Bull and Bullen President, 
Mr. Don Blackley, in 1995. The days of having to make up each product from the raw ingredients were long gone, as the vast majority of items, such as tablets and mixtures, came pre-made from the wholesaler. However, there are still times when we have to roll up the sleeves and pull out the old mortar and pestle. Many creams still have to be made the old-fashioned way, and we now routinely manufacture melatonin and omeprazole mixtures for children, as these products are not marketed by commercial pharmaceutical companies. One of the biggest changes I've witnessed since starting my career is the introduction of robotic automated machines. In 2015, we started using a blister pack robot, which was designed to help increase the speed and accuracy of producing our weekly medicine blister packs for our home-based patients. Instead of having to place each tablet in the pack by hand, tablets are now stored in individual canisters, which allows the machine to automatically drop the required tablet straight into the blister pack. So what once may have taken 10 minutes by hand can now be carried out by the machine in a matter of seconds. With the outbreak of World War II, he enlisted in the army with his brother Ted. He was underage at 17 and his parents would not sign the enlistment papers. His sister signed them as long as they both went in together. They both saw service in the Middle East, New Guinea and Dutch New Guinea in the artillery. Luckily they both survived. Dad contacted malaria in New Guinea which would affect his life for many years. Every year in May until the late 50s, it would come back and he would be very sick. He did not talk about the brutality of the war, but only of his mates. It was on a leave break that he met our mum, Margaret Cutts, who lived in Mooney Ponds. They married while he was still serving. I know in the war, when Dad got home, he had a lot of problems with his hearing. I don't know, it was caused through him being a gunner and on a I think they called him a 25-pounder. He was a loader, and it was consistently the explosion going off in their ears. He had that for most of his life when he came back home. Drew an RSL sub-branch. He was president for over 20 years and fought to keep it going when membership numbers began to wane. He organised the Anzac March for over 20 years and visited schools each year to make a presentation. He never once glorified war. He believed if you forgot something, there was a real possibility you would do it again. The resurgence of the RSL over the past few years was welcomed by him. He received many awards from the RSL and helped many veterans gain benefits they deserved. He was awarded the Victoria Anzac of the Year Award, which was presented to him by the Victorian Governor-General at Government House. John and I, along with three RSL mates, attended this ceremony. The Victoria Anzac of the Year Award had to be nominated by the RSLs in Gippsland. The President of Sale and Warrigal joined us for the presentation. Jack's daughter, Robin Webstale, read a poem that Jack wrote about Druin. I have seen most of the country and many places I have been, but I must admit that Druin is the best I've ever seen. There is beauty in this lovely town that greets the wanderer's eye. It makes one wish to settle here and not to pass it by. It nestles in among the hills like a jewel in a crown. There's parks and gardens everywhere to decorate this town. There are huge grey gums to welcome you and shield you from the sun. And along each entrance to the town are the lovely flowering gums. There are gardens full of lovely flowers to catch the watchful eye and shrubs of every colour here to attract the passerby. The people are a happy lot and really love their town. They always work in harmony. There is no time to frown. Each year we hold a festival. Physifolia is its name and people come from everywhere so great has come its fame. The flowering gums are all in bloom. They're blossom rich and rare. It makes this town a paradise. Make sure that you are there. The wind blows softly over the hills and down the lovely vales. It brushes against the wattle bloom and a wonderful fragrance prevails. Oh yes, I say in a quiet voice, there is so much to see. So wherever I go or whatever I do, this town is the place for me.